Imagine you're flying on a chartered flight on a brand new Max 9 Boeing aircraft. Takeoff has gone smoothly and you are gradually ascending. And then suddenly there is a deafening bang and a whole piece of the aircraft flies off. It sounds unbelievable and completely terrifying, but this is exactly what happened on Alaska Airlines Flight 2580. This incident has caused the FAA to ground all MAX 9 aircraft and has raised serious questions for Boeing to answer. Coming so soon after the MAX 8 air disasters, we ask, is it still safe to fly Boeing? Joining us to discuss this incident, its possible causes and its potential impact on Boeing is former airline pilot and safety specialist Terry Tozer. Enjoy the interview. So to discuss this topic and everything related to it, I'm delighted to be joined now by Terry Tozer. Now, Terry is an ex-airline pilot with more than 20 years of experience in the aviation industry. He's an expert in all things aviation safety, written extensively on uh, aviation safety incidents, and is also author of the book, Confessions of an Airline Pilot, Why Planes Crash. And you can get a link to that in the description of uh, this podcast. Uh, so Terry, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, so to start off with, can you um, bring us and our listeners and viewers up, up to speed with what exactly we know so far about this latest MAX 9 incident? Yes, I can. Um, um, just to correct one thing, I, I don't call myself an expert in anything, really. I'm just, uh, 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 I used to sit up the pointy end and I've written a book about it. So that's about the limit of my expertise, really. Um, yeah, this um, this is a, um, an extraordinary event, this um, loss of this piece of fuselage or basically a, do a dummy door. Um, it's obviously not going to help Boeing's reputation, and specifically not that of the MAX variant. Um, it's very hard to know at this stage what it is um, that caused it. Um, I suspect the fact that they've uh, grounded all of that variant means that the uh, FAA are concerned that it might be a design issue with the way that um, section is held in place. Of course, it could have been just specific to that one particular aeroplane um, when it was assembled in the first instance. Um, but obviously, you know, it's um, a, a major problem for Boeing and um, there will be a lot of airlines um, who, well, I think there's probably about half a dozen that have now had to ground their MAX 9s and um, no doubt disrupting everything and costing a lot of money. Mm, no, absolutely. And Boeing share price has fallen uh, this morning as a as a result of all of this. Yeah. And so how how common is it for these kind of blowouts to to occur? Because this isn't the first time this has happened, is it? Very, very rare indeed. Um, the sort of instances you might be referring to, are you thinking of the one where I think it was um, um, it was in, a U, in the US where uh, an engine blew up and took out a window? Um, um, that was a rather different set of circumstances and in, in, involved a catastrophic engine failure um, which damaged the, um, the fuselage next to it. Um, there, have, um, there was back in the 1980s a BAC 111 of British Airways lost the captain's windshield and almost lost the captain with it. Um, but those are you know, these are almost unheard of, really. Uh, you you could, in theory, get a, a sudden decompression, and pilots train for it. We we did it dozens of times in the in the simulator. Um, mm. So you know the drill, but obviously, um, hope well, and certainly in my experience, nothing like it ever happened. So. Mm. And um, are we right in saying that in this um, specific um, incident, thankfully nobody uh, was hurt and the plane landed safely, um, but it could have been a lot worse. And is that to do with if people were near where the blower happened, if they didn't have their seat belts on, if the plane was higher? Because I think it was at 16,000 feet or so when yeah. the incident happened. So, you know, we were quite lucky in this case. Yes, very lucky. Um, I mean, the pressure differential at that altitude would be roughly half what it would have been at cruising altitude, and it would have been a very different story then. 
you're also more likely to have had people without seat belts on, maybe walking about. Um, yeah, I mean, it could have been extremely nasty. Um, and, um, there's, you know, a lot of very serious questions have to be asked um, and answered uh, as, to, as to what's behind it all. Mm, absolutely. And um, I guess kind of the the most kind of the biggest question on all of this is how on earth could something like this happen? You know, if you're on a plane, you're flying and then a part of the aircraft flies off. Yeah. And this is a this is a brand new aircraft as well. So, yeah. Terry, help us understand how on earth is this even possible? Um, well, I mean, you know, the question is not fully answerable at the moment, but um, I would refer back to um, a documentary made by Al Jazeera a few years ago now called On a Wing and a Prayer. Um, and that focused on the fact that Boeing subcontract a lot of its fabrication work to various subcontractors based on the lowest price. Um, and they found um, some procedures that were being carried out incorrectly during that process. Now, um, I can't really comment. I don't know um, whether the you know, corrections were made. I would assume so. Um, I think we go back um, probably also to the regulator, because mm. um, the Federal Aviation Administration has never impressed me personally. And um, I know that the man who used to be in charge of the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK for certification, Di Davis, he was the man they had to satisfy to get a new type certified. And he was never impressed by the FAA either. And, and, and the reasons are that they've always been very industry friendly. Now, you know, America is capitalism bred in tooth and claw. And, um, you know, there's um, a great keenness on not putting any restrictions on a private enterprise um, a, a company. And obviously Boeing are a huge American icon and um, a vital piece of their economy. Now, Di Davis always said that he had little faith in the FAA, but total faith in Boeing. Now, things have obviously changed, and I think we saw that with the introduction of the original Max design, which breached so many basic principles of aircraft design that it should never ever have got past any kind of regulator, but it did. And then it killed over 300 people. Um, so what are the FAA doing in all this? One would have thought that after the max fatalities, there would have been a root and branch review and um, you know some changes. Maybe there has been, uh, but you know, I, I would like to know what the process is that um, the FAA go through when certifying Boeing aircraft or any aircraft for that matter. Mm, and I guess as well, it's particularly concerning that this was a brand new plane. It's a brand new Max 9 plane. So can you tell us a bit about the, the Max 9 plane generally? Is it, a, is it an update on the, the Max 8 variant that was kind of in the news for all the wrong reasons? <laughs> It's a slightly, a slightly bigger. Um, it's got some options, and this, this, uh, this door, in fact, that is the kind of guilty party in this event, is one of the options. You can opt for a very high density model, um, which I believe is what Ryanair are using, and that's why they're not affected by this airworthiness requirement to ground them, because if you've got that emergency exit operative as an emergency exit, the same issues do not arise. Right. And so um, what they've done when when the aircraft is produced is produce an aperture in the fuselage that can take an emergency exit or be blanked off, okay. which is what happened in this case, because Alaskan Airlines did not want the high density configuration. Um, but the whole principle of the MAX, um, and this goes back to the very beginning, um, is that they changed a very, very old design now. The 737 originated in the 60s, and uh, 
you know that's it's been updated and updated and modified and tweaked and fine-tuned in, in my view too many times and uh, I think what happened was the competition from Airbus was so uh, strong with the NEO and the A320 and the whole Airbus family that Boeing felt the need to produce um, a more fuel efficient version of it which meant fitting bigger high bypass engines and they could not fit underneath the wing in the way that the others did because of ground clearance. So they moved them forward and up and that affected basically the balance of the aircraft, made it inclined to pitch up. And so they put this MCAS system in, mm. um, which was the basic cause of the two fatalities and uh, they've had to address that with software changes and what have you but um, you know it's yet another chapter in a model design that's got a pretty unhappy history I think really. Mm, and I think it's probably fair to say that the Max brand is now irreparably damaged in in whatever way but I guess I guess the, the problem is am I right in saying there are already advanced orders for more max jets already with many airlines oh, I'm sure there are and um, of course one of the reasons it's produced um, such interest is because it is fuel efficient you know these big high bypass and by high bypass I mean you know uh, only a smaller a smaller amount of um, air goes through the core of the engine to be mixed with fuel and burnt which drives a fan and that produces a lot of thrust um, around the outside of the engine core and that's the bypass element and modern engines both for fuel efficiency and sound are increasingly high bypass and um, it's made it a very fuel efficient airplane um, but obviously um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people are very unhappy about flying on them now. The problem is when you buy a ticket, how do you know what you're going to get on? Mm, absolutely. And from your experience, and it's a, it's a question I perhaps didn't think I was going to ask, but is it safe to fly on a Boeing plane at the moment? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, you know, the, the, the many, many Boeings have been doing stellar service for for decades um, um, but um, yeah I mean uh, if, if I were running an airline right now would I want to buy Boeing or Airbus I think I'd probably be more interested in Airbus um, but you know it, it, Boeing can rescue their reputation but they're going to have to work pretty hard to do so I think. Mm, absolutely and and there's been some news that's come out this morning um, that apparently um, they Alaska Airlines were aware um, that the Boeing plane uh, had some kind of pressurization um, problems with it and that it had been prevented uh, from doing long haul flights over water and they were just doing domestic flights. Um, a lot of people when they hear that might ask the question of why on earth was it still flying? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a very good point and of course you know hindsight being cheap now that looks um, like a pretty questionable decision doesn't it having said that I mean I, I flew um, in one aircraft in our fleet um, that I was flying back in the 90s um, had a tendency to have a whistling main door and the the door seal um, that sealed that so that the aircraft could be pressurized inflates when the engines start and you pressurize the aircraft. Um, now it, it's not entirely uncommon for you know maybe for, for a seal to wear and need replacing. Um, obviously that's not going to be the case in a brand new aeroplane but we would probably uh, the engineers would um, use some kind of sealant or tweak it so we could keep the day's operation going. Um, and then a new seal would be fitted and it would be OK. Mm. So, you know, it's not it's, it's not going to be a, a sudden catastrophic change in pressure. You might find you it, let's just say, for example, a, a, a door was leaking um, more than just a little. 
um, you would start to get warnings to that event and that you couldn't maintain the pressurization. You would be, you would maybe have to descend to a lower level or reduce the pressure differential, but it wouldn't be an urgent or a catastrophic issue like this. Mm. That's a different thing altogether. Mm. And um, when this um, incident occurred um, on board, can you talk us through um, what um, what the pilots, what procedures the pilots would have followed and whether they took all of the, the correct actions and the actions of the crew on board? Well, um, we don't know what the pilots did in, in detail. Um, what we do know is that um, they made an emergency descent and returned to where they'd come from. Um, now, what you would do, what, um, we practice this in the simulator until the cows come home, um, you know, your first action is to put an oxygen mask on. So, you know, the crew up the front are not going to pass out. And then you initiate an emergency descent and get yourself down to 15,000 feet. Well, in this case, they were almost there. So you can breathe at 15,000 feet without an oxygen supply or pressurization. Um, so from that point of view, they were, it was pretty easy for them to reach that level. Um, and then they they would appear to have done all the right things. My only question, um, and I haven't heard the very beginning of the air traffic control trans transmission, but there is a tendency, I think maybe in North America more, for non-standard phraseology. Um, you, you probably heard the trans, you probably heard some of the, you can get it online, you know, the transmissions between the flight deck crew and the uh, uh, and the ground controller, and he had to ask them if it, they were declaring an emergency. So, you know, what your standard phraseology would be, mayday, 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 whoever you're calling, you know, Houston Control or whoever it might be, you know, um, we have depressurization, we want an immediate descent, emergency descent. And, and that will allow the guy or the girl on the other end to say either clear to descend or turn right heading blah blah or left blah blah and descend to make sure you're clear of traffic um then you sort it out afterwards once you've done that um and i think they did all that but they i don't know why they didn't use the word mayday 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 because it cuts through everything takes total mm. priority over everything else that's why that's why they came up with the idea no that's a really that's a really interesting point and on the um on the cockpit conversations um we've been told that the cockpit voice recording um is not uh the full cockpit voice recording is not available uh, because it's automatically wiped after a two hour uh window um yeah. is is that right because that again is one of those things uh as a layman i go really yeah yeah um yes i mean it can um i guess you know, that there might be variations between um, cockpit voice recorders. I know that the ones that we had, um, if you reach, when you restart the aircraft, you, you park it on stand, passengers get off, passengers get back on and you fire it up, you've just wiped everything that was said on the flight before. Mm. So maybe they now have a two hour loop you know, and after two hours, it wipes automatically. Um, there's sort of logic in that because the CVR was really there to assist accident investigation. And so, you know, it's really the last part of any flight, whether it ends well or badly, that you're interested in. Mm. I don't understand why two hours should have been exceeded, though, because as far as I understood it, it was back on the ground in less than two hours. So I, I can't explain that um, unless somebody kind of fired up the system again once the aircraft was on the ground and wiped mm. the tapes um, or the disc as a result of that. It's possible. Mm. It must have um been for the passengers on board a very kind of terrifying experience you can you can't even really begin to imagine what it's like to be cruising and then suddenly this happened and sure. 
So as an airline pilot, can you reassure listeners and viewers about the the safety of airplanes generally? There'll be nervous flyers who have seen this and said, I'm never getting on the plane again. <laughs> Yes, I can. And and it's um, I, I actually have a bit of an issue with my publisher for choosing such a lurid title because um, I, I find that a lot of people think, oh, I'm not going to read that if I'm going to get on another aeroplane. In fact, um, I cover all this. Um, how safe is it? Who's safe and who isn't? And how do I tell? That's why I wrote the book, um, because basically it is an extremely safe form of travel. Um, and I say in the book, basically, the most dangerous bit of my day when I was flying was driving to and from the airport, mm. you know, without doubt, you know. Um, that said, there are inevitably in any industry, you get good and bad. Um, and there are, I have my own personal little list of airlines I wouldn't fly with. Um, and, you know, um, I'm afraid that um, not everything is perfect. Um, and actually, as I say, that's why I wrote the book, because it tells you how you can choose who you want to fly with and be reasonably sure that they're they're going to get the other end in one piece, you know, which the vast majority do. I mean, you only have to look at websites like Flight Radar 24 to see the enormous density of aircraft. I mean, there's thousands up there all the time. And the number of incidents and accidents that you come across are very, very limited. Mm. And on your list, will airlines who fly the Max 8 or Max 9 be <laughs> added to that list? Um, I'd be more interested in the individual airline, I think, than the design of, of the aircraft, because right. any any responsible, competent airline will make sure that their passengers are safe. Um, having said that, obviously, Alaskan were caught um, by this particular one, weren't they? I mean, they weren't doing anything wrong. Um, this happened to them as well as their passengers um, as a result of whatever this fault was. Um, but as a general rule, um, you know, if we work on the principle that nothing is guaranteed to be 100% safe, um, would I worry about flying as a passenger no i don't um but then there are airlines i don't get on so i don't have that problem mm. <laughs> you know and it's it, basically it, about culture mm. and i guess that comes back to the the, the bowing point on culture because if if this is found to be some kind of manufacturing flaw or manufacturing um issue with the with the max 9 aircraft um that could feasibly be the end of boeing couldn't it well, I don't know. I mean, it's a very big company and um, I'm sure that the US government would do quite a lot to make sure that it wasn't the end of Boeing, um, as well as what Boeing would do. Um, I, I have to say I was quite shocked that after the Max 9 crashes, it took an awful long while for the chief executive to resign. Mm. Um, they've kind of rescued their well, as we saw, their share price was going up and up and up, um, and now it isn't. Um, but I, I, I fear that there might be a, a rather too big a focus on share price. And um, I mean, there was a time, I mean, Di Davis, who used to be the man you had to get past in the UK, I mean, he certified Concord, he certified the first 747 on the British register. I mean, he flew everything that that had a British registration during his time as the Civil Aviation Authority's chief test pilot. And he was absolutely rock solid about how wonderful Boeing aeroplanes were. Um, things changed. Something changed. And, you know, that anyone who was diligent and, uh, and a, uh, had a good knowledge of Boeing history could probably go through the history and find out at what point at which which boss came along and made accountants and their figures more important than continuing the old Boeing philosophy. I mean, it was a remarkable company. The 707, 
I have friends who flew them and they were eulogistic about it. Absolutely wonderful aeroplane. Same with the 747. Um, stellar reputation and um, had, had none of these kind of problems. So what changed? Mm. And if it is that um, cultural point, I, I guess it's a lot harder to change a culture if it's become embedded. And is your kind of view from your understanding that this has been motivated by money and speed, by having to produce planes quicker and to compete with Airbus, and that has had an impact on quality and quality control and assurance and all of those aspects? Um, it, it's possible, isn't it? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't claim to know the inner workings of Boeing well enough to give you definitive answers, but, you know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, if you if you if you if you were a, an insurance company, um, you don't look at um, the nitty gritty. You say, gosh, look, um, 21 year old males who've just had a driving license for six months are more likely to have a crash than 50 year old housewives who've been driving for 20 years. Um, you don't actually have to know why. Mm. You know, so you look at the before and you look at the after, in this case, and something's changed. Um, whether or not there, there's been sufficient reform since the original Max tragedies, um, it's impossible for me to, to judge, really. Mm. And for um, viewers and listeners in the, in the UK, I believe there's a few UK airlines who operate the uh, Max A and Max Nine. Um, I think Ryanair and Tui uh, both have them in yeah. in their fleet. Um, how does our um, regulation work in the in the UK, and how is that different from the US regulation? You were saying that we haven't grounded Max Nine aircraft. So how does the difference in regulation work? Well, I think the reason that they haven't been grounded here is because they they've got a proper emergency exit in that place where this plug came out. So the same technical issues don't apply. That's mm. the reason for it. Um, as my understand it, any aircraft type that has to go on the UK register, and that now bear in mind that there are some airlines like Ryanair that actually are registered in Ireland. Um, and that's not a suggestion that there's anything wrong with the Ryanair aircraft uh, because they've got this extra door. But, you know, if it's going to be registered in the UK, it has to satisfy the UK Civil Aviation Authority. And um, although it's actually a very old story, there is one um, in issue that um, illustrates the point very well. I mean, you may remember the DC-10 uh, when it was first introduced um, to the market, um, the British regulator would not certify it because um, the hydraulic lines that, that controlled um, the control surfaces. So it's a hydraulically powered airplane. When the pilots shift the controls, it's all done by hydraulics. Now it had an engine mounted in the tail and those three hydraulic lines, and there are three there because you have, you have what's known as redundancy. They're not there because you need three for it to function. They're there so you've got a couple of backups if anything goes wrong and they were all went underneath the engine and the civil aviation authority said if you had a catastrophic engine failure it, it might damage the hydraulic lines which would leave you without any controls mm. um so mr mcdonald douglas you have to reroute at least one of those hydraulic lines so that it's nowhere near that engine which was done and then the aircraft was on the British register. And we all know about Freddie Laker and others that operated it. Um, that was not done in America. And one day, um, a DC-10 um, in the cruise had a catastrophic engine failure that cut all three hydraulic lines and left the crew with no controls. Um, the crew then performed the most outstanding feat of airmanship and tried to land it at Sioux City by using power and differential power settings to control the aircraft and they almost got away with it 
it ended up with a kind of crash landing in which a lot of people died, but an awful lot of people didn't because of the skill of the flight deck crew. But it should never happen because that mm -hmm. that was an that was a design certification that you couldn't get past the, a British regulator, and there will be other regulators in Europe and elsewhere that would probably have had the same issue. Um, now, why would the FAA certify it? Probably because the cost of McDonnell Douglas redesigning their aircraft would have been enormous. I don't know. That's my guess. But, um, Mm. And um, so the FAA would have certified both the Max 8 and Max 9 yeah. aircraft. Um, have they, they would have both been certified by the UK regulator as well um, before, they, um, before they went into action. So is there a question generally about regulation? Obviously with Max 8, you then had the Max catastrophic failures. Um, so is there a question there about how strong the regulators are, how thorough they are? Well, there is a question. Um, I, I'm not sure that, um, and I could be corrected on this point, I don't think there were any Max 8s operating in the UK before the two crashes. Okay. Um, they were on order. Um, I don't know whether there were or not. Um, there might have been, um, and if they were, I have a feeling they might have just grounded them um, until they found out what went on. But, you know, that was a real scandal because mm -hmm. um, never in my life have I heard of a situation in which a manufacturer uh, produces an aircraft with a system that can take control of the aircraft that the pilots knew nothing about, didn't even know it existed. I mean, that flies directly in the face of all safety principles. When when you go to fly a different type of aircraft, it's called a type rating, you go into the classroom and you spend three or four weeks learning about all the systems and all the technical issues you need to know about the aircraft before you then go in the simulator and learn to fly it. Um, now, you would never ever have a situation in my experience where you would suddenly find, why is it doing this? I can't stop it, it's pitching down. I have no way of turning it off. Um, and that was the situation with the um, the original MAX aircraft. Um, now, the Federal Aviation Administration had certified people within Boeing to be the FAA inspector, marking their own homework. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, I was shocked to the core when I heard that. I couldn't believe that could ever happen. Mm. It's, it's absolutely um, extraordinary. And I think Boeing's reaction after the first crash as well, uh, where it was kind of um, it was kind of pointed at the pilots. Did they did they perform correctly? Yeah. I think as well was was you know, added to the outrage of many. Of course it did. And um you know, and the other thing is that was really peculiar about that design um, was where this this mysterious um, MCAS system got its information from. Um, now, if you look at the nose of an aeroplane, you might see a little thing on the side, which is, it, I mean, they're called vanes, you know, and they measure the angle of attack. So. The angle of attack is basically the angle at which the aircraft is presented to the airstream. And, you know, you don't need to be an aerodynamicist to know that, you know, there has to be a limit to how far up you can pitch and for the thing to still fly. So this was designed to stop it going beyond a certain pitch up attitude, mm. as, as indicated by these vanes. The problem was that there were two vanes, one on either side of the aeroplane. And in the both cases where the crashes occurred, one of them was faulty, but it wasn't talking to the other one. So it wasn't a question of a warning coming up on the flight deck saying, watch out for your angle of attack. And had that happened, or if it had said attitude, the crew would have looked and said, well, I don't have an attitude problem, so I don't need to do anything. But instead of which, 
it decided that they were pitched up too far and just wound the nose down and there was nothing they could do to stop it. It must have been absolutely terrifying. Um, now, how could you have a situation where you go through all this business of redundancy, where you have two or three systems all the time to cover everything, mm. and yet that that dreadful system was controlled by one sensor, which failed. And they were new aircraft. Why did it fail? Mm. And are we right in saying that the the pilots weren't even aware of what this MCAS system no, was? Didn't know it existed. Mm. And how how can that possibly happen? How can they roll out new software on an aircraft and pilots in charge of the aircraft not be aware of it? I, I, that's what I'm saying. I've never, ever known that ever to happen. I was shocked. I couldn't believe that a manufacturer would do that. Mm. Um, and I, I rang a friend of mine who is a Boeing pilot and he has, he, he's issued with an iPad with all the technical information and he went all through. He had the technical manual which would in when the ones I've got here from my old aircraft are about that thick. Mm. He searched through that and MCAS didn't come up at all. You know, it just wasn't there. Mm. It's, and they've it's, done this because by putting these bigger engines on, uh, it changed the handling characteristics of the aeroplane. Um, now, I would suggest that their alternative to doing this was to say, well, we have, to, in order to compete with the Airbus Neo, we have to design a new aeroplane. Well, obviously, huge, a huge change. I mean, that's a big thing to do. Or um, we have to call this a different type rating. It's not a set. It's not one. You know, when you get a, a qualification, if you're a 737 rated pilot, you can probably fly several different variants of a 737 all on one type rating. And if it's something where there's a bit of a difference, you get a differences course. So you go in there and you say, well, the difference between the one you're used to and this one is this, but you don't need to relearn the whole airplane. Now, in order this is my speculation, to avoid having a differences course or a new type rating, which costs the airline money and therefore makes the MAX less desirable than a NEO, because because if you're going to have to have a new type rating, then they suddenly become equal. Mm. If you're a 737 operator, and you can tra transfer your pilots onto the MAX just by either a small differences course or no course at all, it makes the, Bo the Boeing more commercially desirable. So it, to me, and this is just my opinion, it looks like a commercial decision, not an air safety or a, or a design decision. Hmm. But is that not criminal? I, I would have thought so. And I, I'm, I'm very disappointed that people are not imprisoned. Hmm. I mean, they've killed 340 odd people by what on the face of it appears to be deception. Mm, absolutely. And um, we know now that the MAX 9 has been grounded by the FAA. Um, uh, so what are the next uh, steps on this and what do you expect to happen in the in the coming weeks? Well, I imagine that um, the very first thing they'll look at is is the example aeroplane. I gather they found the missing door now. Mm. Um, and perhaps by looking at that and then stripping out the interior panels in the grounded um, aircraft, they'll be able to determine whether this was a one-off, a, a, a problem with the way this particular aircraft was assembled, or whether it's a design problem, or whether maybe the way they assemble them means that others could be assembled incorrectly. Um, so that shouldn't take them very long to check everybody else's 737s, but um, until we get some feedback um, from the authority, it's very hard to say, you know, but that's, I reckon, what they'll be looking at. Was it this one or was it all of them?
No, absolutely. And um, you were an airline pilot for many years. You've flown many planes. And as you say, um, you know, it's the safest form of um, transportation. But during your time as a as a pilot, were there any nerve wracking moments? Any <laughs> times when you got a bit nervous flying? I'll read my book. And you'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, um, I had a couple of um, sort of overstimulating moments, shall we say? Um, um, once um, with, in the, in a, with a passenger aircraft, and once when I was flying long haul cargo on a um, very old aeroplane, which um, was subject to strange eccentricities and um yeah i mean we had a we had a fire on that when we had a cargo bay full of torpedoes which concentrated the mine somewhat um but you know you can read the whole story if you like it's all it's all there <laughs> and that's a brilliant uh segue into into your uh into your book as well so um Terry, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for explaining uh, no the, the background to these two incidents. Uh, as we said, Terry's book, Confessions of an Airline Pilot, Why Planes Crash, is available now. And there's a link to that in the description. Terry, thank you so much. You're welcome. Anytime. <laughs>